and welcome to Transforming Language Education, the vodcast series where we will talk about the future of teaching, inquiry, and advocacy in language education. I'm Jen Crawford. And I'm Rob Philback. Please like or subscribe if you want to join us in helping to transform language education. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Transforming Language Education. Today, we have our guest, Luba Hodges, who is faculty at the International Academy at the USC. Welcome, Luba. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Luba. Yes, and this is uh, part two in a three-part series. Uh, in part one, we talked with Luba about her experience uh, and her really obsession and investment in uh, pursuing uh, English language. Uh, in this segment, we're going to talk about her experience starting an immersion uh, an English immersion language camp in Russia. And uh, Luba, we're really excited to to hear about your story and about this experience. So maybe you can just start us off by what inspired you to, to organize this uh, English immersion camp? Well, what inspired me to organize it was the topic of my dissertation. I was graduating from the university and I knew that I wanted to continue studying. And once I decided to get into a PhD program, I was looking for a topic. And since I was a summer camp kid, uh, mm -hmm. I went to summer camps my whole life since I was the age of six, probably. Uh, which in Russia, by the way, is very popular. They're very affordable, and a lot of kids go there for a month, and they have a lot of activities. They come back, and it's like a, you have a brush, breath of fresh air there in the camp. Mm -hmm. So when my academic advisor introduced this idea to me, I thought, yes, that sounds like me. So I chose this topic and uh, I was just looking for some company that would allow me to experiment. Um, and I found the tourist company um, and they said, okay, yes, you can organize your camp and we will sponsor it. Um, and we started with 30 kids. I think it was 30 kids. This was our first enrollment. And when I left four years later, we had more than 200 children in this camp. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure that there's a lot involved there, right? How did you find the teachers? Um, you know, was, was, did you, how'd you figure out how much to charge? Uh, how did you get everybody on board to the, because I assume you wanted to maybe experiment with a new teaching approach? Maybe, you know, uh, uh, can you fill out of some of those details that I think are probably looking back were mm -hmm. maybe challenging? These are all good questions. I can tell you right away that I was not responsible for finance. Um, all I was responsible for is for creating a curriculum and finding teachers, which was difficult because, as we all know, a lot of things depend on teachers. Um, but right. since I had um, the freedom of choosing and it were offering uh, this opportunity to anybody from my university, I knew personally people who I was working with. So I offered it to them and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. We'll experiment. And so I had a great team from the very beginning just because I knew these people. And uh, I created, with the help of my academic advisor, I created a curriculum for the camp. And all we needed to do, all I needed to do, because I was running it, I was the director, was just to make sure that we are doing what is written in the curriculum. And then later, this curriculum became, uh, and the description of the camp became um, the basis for my dissertation. This is fascinating. So uh, I would like to know about uh, the curriculum, more about the curriculum and what it looks like. But before we jump there, I was wondering, what about the learners, right? So you talked about how you got the teachers or, you know, the connections that you used to get your teachers and whatnot and what you were responsible for. What about the learners? How did, how did you find students who would enroll in this camp? 
uh, who were these kids um, or were they kids? <laughs> I'm assuming we're assuming these are kids because, uh, you know, it's a summer camp, right? But like, tell us more about that. Mm -hmm. And again, I was not responsible for advertising, thank God. Mm -hmm. uh, I was only responsible for the educational part of the camp. Uh, but I know how the company did this. I know that uh, this was in in the 90s and English was becoming popular in Russia and a lot of parents wanted their kids to learn English. Uh, so they advertised on TV, they advertised in newspapers. This was a somewhat new approach where they advertised the idea that your kids will be speaking only English for the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. And and we just had to have a small group of kids in the beginning. We had 30. There were more people who wanted to sign up. It was mostly parents who wanted their children to speak better English, or they were uh, kids who were interested in English, again, because of songs. I found out that we had a lot of kids who decided to learn English because they fell in love with Freddie Mercury or mm -hmm. I don't know somebody who's British pop Brit pop um, so this was not a problem as far as I'm concerned as far as I know this was not a problem to find clients mm -hmm. uh -huh. did you um, so as part of your dissertation um, you know was there sort of an evaluation or pre-post assessment or how did it tie into what you were doing around this from a research perspective in terms mm -hmm. of writing about this, I'm sure making an argument for why this approach, um, you know, was needed in this particular context or timely. How did that part work out for you? Um, I was looking at uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation of um the children who signed up for the camp. And to answer your question, Rob, yes, we did evaluate them in the very beginning. And we put the kids in different groups uh, that were well, kind of like what we do here, beginner, intermediate, advanced. Mm -hmm. But the condition in this program was that you have to speak only English. You cannot speak Russian. And this is where uh, we I saw how kids with extrinsic motivation um, wanted to do things for some prize. We would say, okay, if you speak only English today, at the end of the day, you would have a prize. And they were little kids, they were like 10 years old. Of course they wanted to have a prize, right? And then we also had high school, high schoolers, yes, who were intrinsically motivated and they did not need any prizes. They just wanted to, be able to speak good English. And we we did theater performances, we did concerts, and they just wanted to do this just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. And this was, uh, and I saw, by the way, this was an amazing thing that I included in my dissertation. I didn't expect this. Uh, some kids came to the camp several times, so they would spend the whole summer there. Wow. And uh, they moved from extrinsic motivation in the very beginning to intrinsic motivation at the end of August. Oh, and they did, yeah, they did not need any any rewards. Ah. It did, and did I'm just curious because you remind us, uh, were the kids a range of ages then? They were middle school to high school. They, okay. The smallest kids were like maybe 10 and the oldest kids were probably 16. Oh, that's great. You must have learned so much about the approach itself. I, I imagine that what you did that first summer, um, that the camp and the approach and the curriculum may have looked quite different. Was it three or four years later when you stopped um, offering it? I, you know, I didn't stop offering it. It's just that my life circumstances changed and I had to move on, but somebody else started running this camp and Got it. As far as I know, five years ago, it was still running. <laughs> Can you wow. imagine so many years later? Yes, um, I did learn a lot of things uh, in this camp. One thing that I did learn was the power of a team. Uh, 
was very important to rely on somebody and to know that you have a backup, to know that people understand you and they are on your side. I learned mm -hmm. there was one lesson that I, our listeners might find interesting that I would like to share with you. This was the very first time I organized the camp and I had four teachers, I believe. Yeah, four or five teachers. And we had a meeting right before we started. The kids were not there yet. The kids were supposed to come the following day. So we had a meeting and I had all my ideas that I wanted to share with them. So I did share it with them and they were sitting there and they were very intelligent, um, very motivated professionals. And they're sitting there and saying, mm, no, I don't think it's going to work. Mm, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to work, Luba. I think you need to think about something else. So the meeting ended, they all went to bed. The meeting was like at nine o'clock in the evening. They all went to bed. I went to my room and I rewrote everything. I, I spent the whole night writing, thinking like, what can I do? Some, I need something different. Then I called um, my academic advisor in the morning and he was like, you need to ask them their suggestions. If they say it doesn't work, then ask them what's going to work. So um, have a morning meeting and ask them to come up with at least two ideas. And that's what I did after a sleepless night. And guess what? Half an hour later, I had so many creative ideas that were better than mine. Mm -hmm. And this was, for me, this was like an epiphany that I realized that all I need to do is I just need to ask, okay, if you say it's not going to work, then what is your idea? Maybe your idea is better. That's great. And it, and it, it's even like the fact that your advisor supported you in that, right? Because it, it it could have been a response of, well, you've done your research, you've developed this curriculum, push through, you know, yeah. um, but I think that that's a great um, anecdote uh, and, and a meaningful one. Yeah, I wanted, I, Katya asked me about the curriculum and I just wanted to say a few words about that because I didn't address mm -hmm. this. Um, our curriculum was mostly focused on fun things. We, the purpose of this camp was immersion program. The purpose of the immersion program was to motivate the children. We understood that it's impossible to teach a kid English in three weeks. And all we wanted to do was expose them to something fun that was in English uh, so that they would go home and maybe say, okay, I want to learn English. So our curriculum was based on songs, on popular movies, on some traditions of Great Britain. Um, so everything that we had, we had theater, everything that we had was very fun oriented. Everything was in English though. That's amazing. And that's how you go from being interested to being obsessed, to being invested, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to where yeah. you are then developing uh, your language and working on it and investing your time and effort into this. Thank you so much, Luba. This is fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Luba, for uh, sharing that. Um, very meaningful. And I'm even thinking of, you know, listeners, teachers out there, others who are teaching, but who encounter opportunities like you had to start something like this, whether it's, you know, in the context of a research um, activity or just many opportunities out there to be involved in different kinds of things like this. So I know this will be useful. So great. Thank you so much. So I'm Rob Philback. Katya Moore. And this is Transforming Language Education. And thank you for listening. Thank you.